consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the What is Asia podcast, season two. I'm your host, Nakota DeFonzo. On this episode, I'll be interviewing Ran Wei. She's a PhD student at Washington University in St. Louis, and she specializes in the media and literature of Japan, particularly that of the media and literature of Osaka. In particular, we're going to be talking about the films of Koreeda Hirokazu, who made uh, most notably Shoplifters, which won the most prestigious award of the Keynes Film Festival in 2018. Uh, she has a lot of great information to share about Japanese media and literature, and I hope that you'll be able to take something away from this episode. Ran, thanks for, for being here today. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Nakota. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ran Wei. And I feel very honored to be here to talk to you about my own research and modern and contemporary Japanese literature. Great. So one thing in the materials that you had sent me, um, you talk um, about these uh, notions of home and notions of tradition as they've been discussed in uh, uh, Japanese literature. And it seems that... Um, a lot of these notions of home and notions of tradition and its subsequent breakdown revolve around 1991. So to give people some context here, what happened in 1991 if we just look at Japan historically? Yeah, so in 1991, simply put, uh, Japan witnessed uh, the collapse of bubble economy, uh, which um, subsequently caused a series of uh, economic recession and and as well as uh, as well as the instability of job market um, and people's um, sense of homelessness. Um, so after the economic collapse of 1991, there's something that happens in the world of literature. There's these changing notions. Um, that sort of rumble previous notions of what's considered correct in Japanese society. What what are what are some of these uh, reverberations that are happening uh, among literature scholars? Well, uh, it's hard to say whether 1991 marked as a workshed uh, for people to start have a different view of the Japanese society or Japanese literature, but let's put it in this way. So uh, the collapse of bubble economy in 1991, as well as this um, um, gas attack uh, in 1995. So basically this um, Shinrikyo, this uh, ca cart, um, um, like they decided to attack pe uh, this, uh, railway in Tokyo and uh, so many people died and became um, into coma or um, they got injured from this incident. So basically there are a lot of people who suffer from this historical trauma at that time period. Mm -hmm. So I guess that kind of um, gradually shaped people's idea about history and how Japanese government uh, viewed or uh, revealed this grand narrative of the society. As you can see um, in literature works such as Murakami Haruki um, and other writers, they try to uh, narrate the historical trauma and try to process uh, this traumatic events in their own way. A lot of Japanese films and subsequent, subsequent literatures, uh, for instance, Japanese director Kurosawa Kiyoshi's films and also um, um, other Japanese writers, they try to respond to this event and um, shape their own narrative um, through this historical traumatic events. 
one person who um, in your prior research you seem to be very familiar with is um, Kore Era Hirokazu. Um, can you explain for people who he is and why he's so important? Yeah, uh, I can say for certain that um, if you need some takeaways for Japanese director, uh, he Koreda Hirokazu, then here are uh, the main takeaways. So he is uh, almost one of the most famous contemporary Japanese directors. And he is also a successful producer, um, editor, and a screenwriter. Um, he started his career as an assistant in television documentary. And um, his first film came out in 1995 whose name is Mavoloshi, uh, that was adapted from a famous Japanese novel. So um, he, uh, one of his recent success is that he won the uh, highest prize in Cannes Film Festival uh, for his film Shoplifters. And also in 2004, um, his film Nobody Knows also received uh, international recognition. I, if I remember it correctly, that would be the Cannes Film Festival um, as well for uh, best acting. Um, his films are very interesting and also very accessible for many people because he particularly uh, deals with this sense of home in his films. Sometimes he either romanticizes home, for instance, in his film Steer Walking or uh, After the Storm, but sometimes he imagines home in another form, uh, which, which is a home constructed through interpersonal connections, for instance, in Shoplifters and also in his 2009 film Air Door. Um, in this film, um, a man he lives with uh, his air door and one day the air door comes back to life and she falls in love with another man at a CD store and she began, begins to have her own uh, consciousness and agency. So um, in, in short, that Koleda's films cover a lot of themes and um, people can always resonate with his films because his film deal with um, homeless, um, different forms of home uh, trauma and also um, nostalgia once in a while. Yeah, I, I think um, at, at least for me, his his most notable mo notable film is, is Shoplifters because I actually did watch uh, okay. the second half of that movie. I was actually in a uh, restaurant when I was living in Xiamen, and that movie happened to be playing. <laughs> on the TV. So I actually saw the last half of it. Um, can you explain for people just generally what the plot of that film is and why it made such an impact in, in the film community? Yeah, uh, for people uh, who may not be familiar with the film, this film in Japanese, uh, it is called uh, Mambiki Kazoku. Um, so, um, in Chinese, it's Xiaotou Jiazu, and in Germany, uh, in English, it's Shoplifters. So, uh, um, so in this film, um, um, Koleda depicts a very interesting family, which consists of uh, the father, who is a day laborer, uh, who who is on a very uh, previous. Uh, sorry, he uh, he is in a very uh, precarious situation, and the mother, uh, she works. Uh, for a, a laundry place. So um, the father and mother, uh, they're actually a couple. And um, the son of this family is actually not related to them by blood relations. So when the story starts, um, the father and the son, they always go to uh, the store and they shoplift. Uh, one day they um, kind of encounter a girl um, if I remember correctly, her name is Yuli. Uh, she suffers from abusement. Uh, she suffers from abuse uh, from the family. So the father and the son decide to take her back to their own family. And at the same time, um, they live in a very uh, shabby and a very uh, kind of like a, a corrupted house. Uh, and um, 
there's also a grandma who lives together with them and the grandma's like money um <coughs> she re she re receives after um she retires from the work mm, this family is supported by the grandma's money and there are also um other interesting characters in the family um including uh the sister um who is also not related to them by blood relations so you could see that um these people they live under the same roof and actually they're at the bottom of this society uh, although they're not related by blood as we imagine uh, how a traditional family might be related they share this very strong interpersonal bonds and although sometimes um, they what they do is against the, the law for instance they shoplift um, and uh, they complain a lot about the government and system but you could see like Koleida observes their life from very um, close relation. Um, I mean, instead of being a judgmental distant observer, he observes their uh, life with his camera uh, with compassion and understanding. Um, I don't want to go to further details just in case I spoil the story. Okay, so he he takes this very new notion of family and and puts this on the screen is, is this something that was uh welcomed when it was played in japanese cinemas what what was the general reaction to this director's new notion of, of family and home yeah that's a very good question i have not researched this before but i think um, this idea of new family or a family in another form is definitely not new to Japanese audiences. But um, uh, so I have not researched this enough. I cannot say it for certain. On the one hand, I think people find it very interesting to see that a family can be sustained through such a bond. On the other hand, I think um, people would begin to reflect on the question why such a family exists and why uh, people, uh, for instance, the people who um, has a, a stable job, unstable job, and who live in a precarious life um, would turn to each other for help rather than turn to government for help. So I guess overall, this film, um, it received a lot of um, acclaim internationally, and it also was uh, welcomed by a lot of people. Although you can still see that Koleda himself, he is not a director who is radical enough to criticize um, the structure of the society or, and, or the oppression that people experience by being a part of um, the, the lowest, um, um, being a part of uh, the group who are ignored by the mainstream society. Koleda did not really ra radically criticize so much about uh, the origin of these problems. Um, so you can say that Koleda kind of also romanticizes a form of home um, in this film. Mm -hmm. And um... In terms of Japanese cinema and Japanese literature, is his film a part of a larger trend in Japan to rethink what home is and to rethink what family is? And um, yeah, I guess we'll start with that, that question and then I have a follow-up afterward. That's a very uh, good question. So uh, actually, uh, if anyone has uh, interest in getting to know the contemporary Japanese society, especially of the collapse of the economic bubble, I highly recommend um, Japanese anthropologist Annie Allison's book, uh, Precarious Japan. So uh, back to your question, Nakoda, I would say um, Koleda's film Shoplifters or Koleda's focus on his interest in this issue of a new form of home is just um, a microcosm of uh, the change in Japanese society. Uh, so let me put it in this way. You will see that Japanese people are actually already, they have imagined the new forms of home or they have 
try to uh, construct a, a place uh, that would com compensate for people's sense of homelessness in different forms. For instance, uh, in Japan, you would find a lot of like cat cafe or like uh, a guinea pig cafe or um, any pet cafe and there uh, are also made cafes. So people go to these places sometimes for comfort um, and also to feel like uh, they belong to a certain community. Um, and also like um, in Japanese literature, uh, uh, one of the most uh, popular uh, contemporary Japanese female writer, his, uh, her name is Yoshimoto Banana. Uh, in her representative work, Kitchen, um, in Japanese it is pronounced as Kitchen. Uh, so she imagines a form of home um, that is also sustained not by uh, blood relations. So the mother of the household, uh, she's actually um, um, the, the, the boy's father who is a transgendered uh, yeah, character. So you can find um, evidence, uh, no matter in contemporary Germany society, um, this cat cafe or maid cafe, or even uh, other um, events or organizations that provide people with a platform of connecting with each other and finding a sense of belonging. And you can also find that um, kind of asks or sentiment in Germany's literature. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and my follow-up to this might perhaps might be, be too broad and I don't know how, uh, comprehensively you'll be able to, to answer this, but you've lived in Japan, you, you've studied there, um, for, uh, a period of time. Um, and often the argument is made that, you know, culture has an effect on politics, which then has an effect on society. Um, have these, have, have films by, for example, Koreeda Hirokazu had an effect on just getting common people in Japanese society to rethink, uh, their notions of belonging. Like, for example, um, if an average Japanese person has, uh, parents that they're kind of distant from, have films like this gotten them to rethink, uh, maybe where their central focus of belonging should be, maybe instead of with their family, with their friends or uh, other colleagues, et cetera? That's a very good question. Uh, again, I think this question focuses more on this reception side. Um, I haven't uh, read too much uh, research or any articles regarding the audience's um, reception of uh, Koleida's films and how Koleida's film, we're talking about the social aspect of Koleida's films, whether his film really changes Japanese people's notions or whether his film just simply reflect the change in Japanese people's notions. But I can say for certain, uh, like for myself, I feel like it um, inspires me to uh, rethink um, the notion of home. Um, yeah. For instance, um, Koleda's uh, film, uh, Nobody Knows, which came out in 2004, is also one of his famous films. It uh, depicts um, the child abandonment um, event, which is based on the real incident, which happened in Japan. The mother um, had, the cho had different children with different men, but one day she decided to leave home and the eldest boy, he has to take care of his siblings. And um, out of some reason, his sister dies and he had to put her in a suitcase. And in some Japanese dramas, you could also see that some a lot about child abandonment and child abuse. So I would say this um, films, no matter Koleda's films or other Japanese dramas or films, re they reflect this issue of uh, the dysfunction of home. Um, so I think sometimes they will go to different directions. They either criticize um, the people who are responsible for this dysfunction of home such as parents or uh, institutions or systems, sometimes they go to another extreme by imagining an alternative home. For me, um, 
it motivates me to rethink um, how people's connections change and how we define our relationship to each other uh, nowadays. I know, Nakoda, probably yourself has thought of this question too. Um, during the pandemic, we're connected by Zoom and the social networks. Um, do you feel like people are more connected through social networks or actually you feel people are more alienated from each other? I mean, a home does not have to be a traditional household. Sometimes uh, the, the people you feel uh, safe uh, or trusted to turn to can also be um, a kind of member of your figurative home, your place of belonging, your community. Do you feel like the pandemic has changed your view of home? Oh, if, well, if you're asking me, um, I mean, I, I would, I would say, um, in a sense, no. I might, I might take the more cliche argument, so as to say that I feel like people have have maybe felt more isolated as a result of not being able to have that that human uh, connection. Um, I mean, you know, some people, and I've I've had debates with people who have said that, um, you know, this. Uh, social media interface can be taken to be a form of space and there can be interactions within that space and certainly there can be interactions within between one another in the social media context but I don't feel like it's true space it's sort of this artificial space and um you know I think it's well anyway I'm, I'm going off onto a large tangent here but um yeah, I, I would I would say I would say that at least for me, I don't think my connections have grown through through social media. They tend to to have grown through in person interaction. But maybe others feel differently. Yeah, actually, I agree with you. I've been thinking of this question. Um, no matter how people feel in Japanese society or Chinese society or uh, in America. Um, whether whether they have felt more connected during the pandemic uh, or whether they have found a sense of home during this pandemic because all of us work from home now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we have to stay at home. Uh, on the one hand, you could see that um, in the case of Japanese society uh, and people are really connected through internet or for instance, through uh, the uh, platform of Twitter, whenever someone um, posted something on Twitter and other people would um, re respond to them and they kind of form a affective bond. Um, and a lot of people are researching the affective bond generated by internet, right? But as you say, it's, sometimes it's not an actual space because people don't need to commit to each other before they join the conversation and to, people don't have to take a responsibility for each other. But um, I don't know whether this is a characteristics of contemporary society. Um, when people's life are suffused with technology, that people tend to choose platforms that uh, actually uh, they prefer or fit their preferences. Um, and people tend to choose uh, to view news or choose to uh, select articles uh, which they are interested in. And you know, sometimes algorithm can also help you to do so. They kept um, recommending the same articles to you again and again. So uh, in this sense, I feel like people sometimes tend to stuck in their own world uh, with a group of people sharing the same world view. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I would say internet creates a kind of bubble for people, although people might feel like um, this little bubble is their home. It's where they find a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap up here, I just wanted to ask you one more question, which is we talked a little bit about shoplifters and we talked a little bit about the book, uh, Precarious, uh, I forget the title again. Precarious Japan. Yeah, Precarious Japan. 
if there are people listening to this who are interested in knowing more about Japanese film, Japanese literature, can you recommend maybe a couple of books and a couple of movies that after watching this, they can then go out and explore for themselves? Yeah. So most books I've been reading, they're uh, produced by uh, academic, uh, by people, uh, by scholars who are in academia. So I don't necessarily know, or I don't know for sure whether they will be approachable to people. But well, I mean, just, I would... just, just in case, you know, you can throw a couple out there. Yeah, so uh, one of the most uh, distinguished uh, gem scholar in Japanese film in the United States is Daisuke Miao. He used to be uh, in University of Oregon, and um, his books on um, Japanese cinema and which uh, wh whose title is the Aesthetics of Shadow uh, talks about this. Um, uh, filming technology in Japan, the genealogy of it, and how uh, sh the role that shadow plays uh, in Japanese uh, film and especially J Japanese cinematography. Uh, for people who are interested in Japanese silent cinema or early Japanese cinema, um, I would highly recommend this book. Um, so um, there is a book on uh, Koreeda, and there is a book on Miyazaki Hayao. I know a lot of people are fans of Miyazaki well, Hayao. A lot of people know who he is. Yeah. So this book by Susan Napier called um, Miyazaki World, A Life in Art, uh, is very approachable, I would say. Uh, this introduces a lot of Miyazaki's works. Um, yeah, so Studio Ghibli, uh, they produce a, a lot of excellent work. So this book, called The Films of Koleda Hirokazu is also very good. Uh, I would say both books are not that deep for people who want to do a very uh, rigorous research, but they're definitely approachable. And uh, it they both solve a lot of questions uh, of people why they watch, yeah, Japanese films by Koleda Hirokazu and Studio Ghibli anime movies. Yeah, great. All right. Well, uh, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks, Fran, for uh, being on with us today. Thank you, Nakoda, for inviting me. Absolutely. So this uh, concludes episode one. Episode two will be released in a couple of weeks. And uh, if you want to see more content, be sure to check out the uh, What is Asia podcast YouTube channel, or you can also check out more content on nakodadefonso.com. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs> and.